Uh, my name is Aaron Tanaka. I'm the co-founder and current director of the Center for Economic Democracy. Uh, we are one of the co-sponsors of the Solidarity Economy Initiative. Um, I just want to also shout out some of the other co-conveners of SEI, uh, Access Strategies Fund, Solidago uh, Foundation, Boston Impact Initiative, Third Sector New England, are amongst a growing number of funders, uh, New Economy Coalition, Chorus Foundation, who have supported this initiative over the years. And we're looking forward to bringing in a whole new community of philanthropic leaders who are seeing the importance of creating space for those of us who are doing work on the ground to think much more radically and much more broadly. And it's an incredible moment for us in Massachusetts to be able to be here with you all with a mix of activists, co-op folks, land trust people, as well as philanthropic leaders and investors, and to collectively be talking about a vision beyond capitalism. I just want, I want us to take that in for a second. Yeah. Okay. So um, it is a great honor to bring up uh, Kali Akuno, uh, who you all know uh, that he is here, and that's why we are all here. It was great to be able to actually organize an event around him, and, and it doesn't surprise me that people were so excited to get to hear from Kali. I've had the opportunity to know him for several years now. We've been building around this theme around how do you build economic democracy in America. And Kali, for me, amongst the many, many incredible leaders I've had the fortunate, uh, fortune of meeting around the country, is one of the most um, grounded, militant, strategic, brilliant, long-term thinking leader who not only is incredibly um, sophisticated with his articulation of the strategy, which, which we all love and appreciate, but but is grounded in the communities, right? That when, you, when I've had the opportunity to go and visit Jackson and meet the others in the community, what, what I really see is that this is a true grassroot, bottom-up movement for revolutionary change. And this does not come out of anywhere. Uh, it comes from decades and decades of work from people like Kali, but also those before him. And so for us, um, while we celebrate Kali and the exciting new book that was co-written, uh, and we'll make a plug for again later, uh, part of us bringing Kali up is also to uphold the legacy of Southern leadership, of black leadership in this country, uh, who many of us in our generations and communities have benefited from their leadership. And so for us, this is an incredible opportunity for us to learn. We also have an amazing panel of people who are going to be responding to Kali's talk, uh, and we'll have some opportunities for all of you to ask questions as well. So um, Kali, I want to bring you up here. I want to thank you all for being here, and we'll look forward to your initial comments. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I appreciate the bringing folks like Hollis Watkins into the room um, because I definitely wouldn't be here for if it was not for folks like Hollis. Um, and nor would I work, you know, the the the, the work of you know like the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement or Chokwe Lumumba. Uh, either as an individual or, or, you know, the forces that he represents. Uh, there's a lot of people who made a lot of sacrifice and a lot of struggle uh, whose names don't get, I think, in, invoked uh, often enough for the contributions that they make um, and the leadership that they provide and the quality of the leadership that they provide. And I'm going to emphasize this piece, in, in particularly in relationship to Hollis, is the quality. Um, you know, Hollis is, for those of you who may not know who he was, in, in our part of the world, he's a, he's a little living legend. He's still around, still kicking, still kicking ass. Um, but very humbly, you know, he's a small, humble little man who carries a lot of power. Uh, and how he centers that power, I think, is very important. Um, you know, which I always try to, to soak up whenever I get an opportunity to be around him. Um, now, what I've been moved to, uh, building on that, what I've been moved to from the, like, what's the day and a half that I've been here now, uh, is to really ask you all some questions at this point. Um. Because I'm going to tell you what I see. Let's start there. Uh, I see an infrastructure uh, that's, that's, while young, fairly well developed. I see relationships with various uh, institutions of capital 
who are even willing to entertain you all talking about capitalism, let alone criticizing it. Uh, I see grassroots work on many different levels, beginning to engage with the solidarity economy uh, in some deep ways, uh, and actually engaging in some forms of struggle which are about expanding the commons, even though you all, you all might not necessarily use that language. Language is secondary to what you're actually accomplishing and, and moving, at least in my view. Um, and I see the beginnings of some, some work around both people's assembly and electoral politics. Is my assessment correct? Right? So part of the thing wants to become what's valuable about what we have to teach. Because you got the same elements of what we brought together in our experience a couple of years ago. You already have it here. So the question for, for me that I have for you guys is like a three-part question. Um, and this is more about depth than it is about surface. So do you all have uh, a shared analysis uh, of the economy, the local, the regional economy? Do you have that? That's one question. Do you have a shared analysis uh, of the balance of forces, particularly on the local and the regional level? Do you have that? Then, do you have a shared vision of where you want to go and then a shared program and strategy of how you're going to get there? To me, it's just the absence of those questions that I don't see you all asking directly yet. That's the missing component that I see, is how do you engage in that process of asking yourselves and struggling with yourselves to come up with answering those questions? Like that's, the, to me, I would say the missing glue if you're aspiring to say, well, some of the things that we've accomplished in Jackson, like how do we get to that point? A critical piece of how we got to that point was starting to ask ourselves new questions. Right? Not asking the same old questions. Um, and building, you know, there's a foundation that you build on all the decades of work. That's important. Because it builds a certain level, in our case, it's built a certain level of trust. It's built a certain level of political space, you know, for us to operate within, within Mississippi. But it really, there was a couple of events that made us ask some new questions. Uh, and some of you who've heard me in the last day and a half have heard me mention two things I've repeated here. One was September 11th, and the other was Katrina. Like those two events successively made us ask ourselves some new questions. And it's the new questions that forced us to engage in some new behaviors. And it was the new behaviors that then led us to formulate a more, in my view, a more sound and concrete strategy that moved us out of some of the dynamics around, uh, uh, I'm not saying this in a demeaning way, but moved us out of some of the dynamics of the kind of the protest model that we had been so much invested in, you know, over like the 30 year period before that, right? And so it was like just a, a organizing people and amassing a certain amount of political strength to stop something is not sufficient. Like, and so it was like us coming up with another thing of saying there's something about, and I'm trying to link it back to Hollis. This is why I started there in part. There was something about this notion grounded in Mississippi for, for a period uh, uh, that many academics call prefigurative politics. How many of y'all have heard that before? Prefigurative politics being the change that you want to see. Right? Like, I can't wait necessarily for the world to be all of what I want it to be, but what can I take agency for in the hearing now that gets me to where I'm trying to go? As opposed to I have to wait for this or I have to wait for that. What are the little steps I can do in the here and now that are actually about I'm living what I'm trying to become and trying to transform the world in the way in which I'm living? That took us something like, that's a notion that's already deep on a certain notion uh, uh, within the civil rights movement, particularly that came out of the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of which Hollis and that group of folks were about. 
And it, there's a connection here, in this, at least in this region, where uh, many of you might know of a, a character by the name of Bob Moses, right? Who's around from these parts, right? Um, uh, who came down to Mississippi on a volunteer basis uh, to help with some of the SNCC work. Uh, and both learned a lot, but also brought some things with him that were in sync with all the practices that were already there, but not necessarily articulated, right? So one of the things I always try to do when I ever go someplace is always speak about the connections that we already are, have with each other that may not necessarily always be apparent. So I'm invoking his name in that history on purpose because he brought some things that were learned in the communities here and in circles, whatever his experience was here, that then you know, brought some things down to Mississippi that helped sharpen up the struggle. So the, the key piece is that we have to recognize in subtle and not so subtle ways, we are always connected. But I think the point that we need to really highlight is how do we make those connections more intentional, more deliberate, right? And, and more long lasting and impact, impactful. Now that some of that has to deal with our capacity, which is always a challenge when you fighting every damn thing. Um, but that's a critical piece of what you know, I want to bring to the table. But I think the critical thing that, that I want to encourage you all to do is forming assemblies and go back to your organizations and ask yourself these questions. Ask yourself these questions. And then from there, start to figure out how you have that level of, of depth of conversation here to move the process forward. Because I think though that's the piece that, that I see is like, you know, if, you, if you're looking at where you're trying to go, that's the, it's like those little questions that, that take a tweak, but it, it'll get you there quickly. Uh, and the thing I would, one of the things that we're, we've learned in the past and I think learning now um, is that difference within that, because you're going to have different answers to those questions, right? That the difference is both natural and normal. But it's the process of how you resolve the difference to come up with a synthesis that's the most important thing, right? The most important thing. Now, that doesn't mean there's some, that you can work with any and all idea. Don't get me wrong on that level. You know, some things do belong in the garbage heap, heap of history. You know, uh, racism belongs in the garbage heap of history. Sexism, misogyny, and patriarchy belong in the garbage heap of history. You know, uh, so those things you can leave aside. And if somebody wants to continue to represent them, sometimes, hey, well, we, we're not ready for you yet. <laughs> you know, when we change some things, then we might be able to integrate you back in in a particular way, right? So uh, yeah, those are things that, that, that I would really share that I think, from our experience, to me, what seems the most practical at this point to bring to you. And I'm, I'm at this stage where I try to be as practical with everybody as I possibly can, right? Um, uh, because while there's, you know, I've been taught by my elders to try to be as strategic as possible, um, I'm always reminded I have two young kids, and they are not going to inherit the same world that I inherited. Right? And it's my responsibility and the generations that are here which have some agency to do some real shit right now to create a better situation for them and those who are coming behind us, right? Because I, I for one, would like it if they could have fresh water, right? I would like it if they're not you know, always hungry and, and suffering because they don't know uh, what the seasons are going to bring, if there's going to be rain, right? Uh, if the oceans are going to have enough oxygen to support fish life for that much longer. So there's a certain level to me where I'm getting at where uh, it may seem abstract, but that's very practical to me in the sense of how do we deal with these questions and what are the central questions that we actually have to, to answer. So like give an example. So like this morning, uh, I keep telling myself I'm going to get off Facebook. I just need to like stop. <laughs> you know, I just need to stop. I'm like, why am I putting myself through this torture of, you know, uh, reading comments about some of the most mundane stuff and seeing like the, 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 the amount of likes for the mundane as opposed to the, the, the critical and strategic. 
Um, so one of the things that really like pissed me off this morning, and y'all indulge me, one of the things that really uh, pissed me off this morning was, now mind you, these are most of these are people who I know and I consider friends in one form or fashion, so I'm like, I actually friended these people, so what does that say about me? So, you know, I'm seeing like this whole debate around uh, Nas and Khalees, and I don't even know what the debate is around, so I, you know, I could be wrong, you know, I'm like, I really don't know what the whole point is. But the level of fervor that some folks are going in at it, I was like, okay, must be, you know, kind of serious. I still ain't looked at it. But then another comrade, and there's like, you know, some whole thread where there's like hundreds of responses and stuff. And then right below that comment was a, a comment from another comrade who does a, a black urban farming project uh, in Kansas City or in, in that area. And he said that the bees have not shown up. Like there are no bees on the farm. And they had like two likes, mine being one of them, or like, like two responses. And it was one of the things I'm like, uh, there's a different gravity in the world between bees not showing up to pollinate plants that we all need to survive and we are very much dependent upon. And whatever this other little thing is going on, and where is our attention focus? Like, where is it focus? And so, you know, that to me is one of these pieces of like, okay, can this, how do we get to asking ourselves the right questions, which then lead us to engaging in different forms of thinking and in different types of action? Like, to me, that's a critical piece. So I, I want to leave you all with the challenge around that. Now, I, th I think you brought me here to talk about Jackson a little bit, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to end with that piece. But I am serious about it. And the reason why I'm, I'm very serious about it, because we need y'all. We need y'all to be successful just like y'all need us to be successful. So I would be remiss in not saying, hey, I need y'all to, to step this up, quicken it up, sharpen it up, make it more powerful. Uh, you know, need y'all real quick, real bad, real fast, right? Um, you know, that's a heartfelt, you know, let's get this together best we can. So I uh, have to put that out. That's a disappointing responsibility. But in our, you know, in our case in, in, in Jackson, and just so folks know who don't know that much about Cooperation Jackson, we're a young organization. Uh, the idea for what we've been trying to do has a genesis that goes back very deliberate and concretely about 12 years. And it's part of a strategy that a group of folks came together uh, with in, in, the, in the course of those two events I, made, I, I mentioned going back to 2001. Now, that exists on a foundation that has layers and layers of pieces to it. You know, you can cite uh, the beginning of MXG being founded in Jackson, Mississippi in 1990 is one point. You can, found, you can uh, uh, cite uh, the Republic of New Africa deciding to make uh, Jackson and, and some areas around that the capital of the Republic. Uh, in 1971 and all those different things like those are all foundations that we stand upon and we wouldn't be here without that being laid so that's a critical piece I'm just a part of a continuity of work right that's it uh, and I have to do my job well to make sure the folks behind me both know this history and represent it better than even I can represent it and then step in that in those shoes right so uh, in our four years I think we've done a few little things right you know, we've made a lot of mistakes, some big, some small. Uh, but we have prioritized a couple of things um, for multiple levels. So one of the things that we prioritized doing as soon as we got off the, the you know, kind of hit the ground running, number one was acquiring land. That's the, that was the number one priority. Number one priority. Uh, and part of that was on the basis of you know, given the context and some of the attention that came with the election, uh, that we was like, there's going to be a little period of window that, that folks will be eyeing us that might last four or five years. Uh, and then the foundations of well-wishers and folks want to give us support. We can either spend that on living comfortably, you know, uh, or we can spend that more strategically in buying some assets that will be here when we're long forgotten you know, by the national media and the national press, but we can continue to do the work in a much more strategic way than we were doing it even before we started, right? Or at least this iteration of it. So that's one of the main pieces. And so that's the basis of 
uh, our community land trust that we've been working on building. And we now have, you know, over 50 plots, uh, 10 homes, uh, a few of them occupied, uh, a few more will be finished by the end of the summer. Uh, we have like four uh, office buildings, one including our center. Uh, we have four uh, co-ops that are, that are pretty developed stages, uh, two which are basically now kind of self-sufficient from, from the main core of the training center, you know, with, of Cooperation Jackson, uh, that being the catering and our what's called the green team, which is the lawn care uh, and composting uh, uh, co-op. Uh, we have the developing community development, I mean, uh, community production uh, cooperative, uh, which is involved in uh, digital fabrication and, and local production, local manufacturing on that basis. We can talk about that. I see some folks who are in that realm. Um, and what am I missing? In farming, right? So that's our, that's our basis. But we've also done some things that have just failed and failed miserably, too. And that's a critical thing to know and un understand. We, we initially we put a lot of effort in doing like a major recycling piece, um, uh, and that kind of fell short in, in for two reasons. One, the level of, po uh, of political support uh, from the then mayor Tony Yarbrough was very weak and very minimal. Uh, and then I think we kind of got wise enough to say that if China stops buying all this stuff, we're going to be in trouble. And sure enough, what's happening now? China stopped buying it, right? So there's a lot of stuff that's like struggling in that regard. Now, I think that struggle is an opportunity to a certain extent uh, because we have to find some way to reuse that material, I think, on a domestic level and figure out their local production of being able to do that. So if folks want to get in a strategic conversation about that, hit me up. Um, but then, you know, the critical piece, I think, to understanding that, just to give you a grounding of what we are doing kind of concretely at this stage uh, with the land trust and the co-op, we're also working, we have a, a time banking system that we're working on, expanding and developing. Uh, we're trying to marry that with, some of you might know it from its Latin American term, uh, treque, uh, which we just call in our community swap meat, right? Folks understand that. And that's, they're actually quite similar in their origin and purpose and intent. Uh, and then alternative currency. So these are things that we're also trying to bring online fairly quickly in an integrated way. And one of the primary reasons being, we are now focused, uh, becoming much more focused strategically on how do we improve the overall quality of life in our community, for our community, than we are about creating jobs. And I want you all to sit with that, right? Sit with that. Number one, capitalism is not in an area or stage where it's actually trying to produce any, much, any more jobs, at least not here, right? Uh, you know, there's still millions of people in Asia and Africa who they can exploit very, very cheap, and they, they much, believe me, we all know they're very willing to do that uh, if allowed politically to make that move. But in the main, uh, more things are going to have to eventually speed up towards automation. Right? The, the logic of the system to a certain extent demands that shift. And that means more, of us are gonna, more and more of us are going to be out of work. But that doesn't mean that there will be a shortage of anything that any of us need. So deal with and grapple with that. So then it becomes a different political question of distribution of goods and services than it is the production of goods and services. Right? And so that's a piece that we're trying to inter inter like intervene in strategically from one small location, but at least trying to be a model of how do poor people, how do black people, how do brown people, you know, get into this particular game and realm and shape it in a way that it can be, you know, for human use and not just for somebody's, you know, extended profit or political control. Because a, a large piece that I think of, of, you know, don't think of just, I would argue, don't just, just think of automation as just labor reducing. It also has a political function. And the, the, I think the most concrete political function that, that we need to grapple with uh, is that its primary function at this stage of the game seems to be to, to reinforce the security apparatus in the security state. Right? Because they're much more kind of drifting, I think, if you look at, let me pose it this way. Now I'm going too, too far, maybe too long. Let me pose it this way. You know, from a strategic thing, uh, 
within the study group that we, we had, we made this kind of analysis and prediction that out of the crisis from 2007, 2008, that we thought there was going to be a massive wave of automation take place, right? And that, you know, the nature of the crisis was, was going to stimulate them to, to go in that direction, particularly after there was so much stimulus that was offered, you know, from the IMF and all the, the at least the, the so-called Western states uh, to their governments to stabilize their economy. But it was very clear that they weren't reinvesting that real quick, right? They were just holding on to it. And they're still fundamentally holding on to it. They're not reinvesting in new capital. So they're just holding on to it. And, but we thought, like, well, why, why are they holding on to it, you know, as opposed to reinvesting that in more AI and more machines? Like, part of that just didn't make sense on a certain level. Um, but I think now if we look at all this stuff with the analytics uh, that are running with Facebook, we see that there is a way in which they actually are investing in it, and that is monitoring all of you, monitoring all of us and creating and becoming much more efficient with big data as a means of social control. So that's where the investment, I think, within this particular realm is, is, is going. Uh, and we need to be involved, not just encountering and protesting that, but also building alternative to that, I think, fairly uh, quickly. Uh, but that's a whole other, again, the strategy realm of, I think, what we need to do. But again, you know, I want you to put Cooperation Jackson in the context of that strategy I mentioned, the Jackson Cush Plan, because we exist primarily and we were born primarily to execute that particular aspect of the plan, right, which is to build the solidarity economy. The other critical part is what Jackson is most known for is the electoral work. I would submit to you that uh, uh, while important, you know, not to diminish it, that's, that's not, I think, the, the, the proper focus that I would at least encourage folks on the left to look at as the main thing. If there's anything that I think I want to encourage folks to look for and fight for wherever you are, I think the driving in, engine of all this type of experimental work should be the People's Assembly, right? And building that as an institution, because what we're ultimately trying to build, I would argue, is people's capacity to govern themselves, right? people's capacity to govern themselves. Uh, and I think that's when we have done it right and we've been on our A game, that's where the power lies and that's, you know, I think the driving animus and the thing that gives force uh, to the work. And I think there's a constant struggle. You know, the people's assemblies and you guys are fine here in Boston, they go up and they go down, right? They go up and they go down for a lot of different reasons, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's just people, you know, capacity to take on another meeting when they got child care duties or they just tired from coming home from work or you know there's just too much going on like those are real concrete limitations uh you know and it in and, and the main thing i think that we learned is not to get dissuaded by the down periods right uh not to get dissuaded by the down periods because one of the things you know what sometimes with folks to come to to like to our home uh, and see some of the work, and there's like a lot of busy work that you'll see, and it'll be like maybe two or three people involved in the busy work. And, you know, you're like, well, where, where's, where's things at and what's going on, what's happening? You know, but it's then you'll see like in the mobilizations where the mass comes out, where you can kind of tell the quality and the affect of your work. And always kind of keep in mind, not everybody can, can exploit themselves to the degree that Cooperation Jackson core folks exploit, exploit ourselves. Because our work doesn't exist without a certain level of intentional self-exploitation. And it can't go on forever. That's one thing that we're clear about. Yes. Right? <laughs> that can't go on forever. Right? Because it's not sustainable for, for folks. But it's a necessary piece of getting the road started. Right? But you can't always expect all your members to engage in that, right? But you have to find ways in which folks can plug in where they can plug in most effectively. And that's not always in front of the farm. That's not always in front of, you know, uh, different types of volunteer work that we do. Uh, it can show up in other different ways, child care stuff, stuff that's often, you know, uh, invisibilized uh, either because of historic nature of how it's been gendered uh, and how it's valued in the public sense. But is without that work, shit don't move, right? It does not happen, 
right? So, you know, and this is a, the hard lesson where the difference between learning something academically and then learning something like in reality. And so for me to my children is the big gap in my understanding of the difference between like, oh, if my folks don't help me with childcare, that means I have to go home and I have to do it, right? Uh, so it's like I really appreciate those folks who do that childcare collective work because it enables me to do what I can do, right? And one is not more important than the other. They mutually reinforce each other, right? Uh, and for us to understand that and, and try to find ways to actually fortify the things that create the glue that aren't public, that aren't necessarily visible because they kind of exist more in a private sphere, of at least how we define it. Uh, but it's essential work, like very essential work. So um, last thing I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, in our, in our work in Jackson right now, you know, I think I'm very excited about where we are overall, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, uh, some of you may have heard about some of the different struggles within the movement that are happening. Um, and you can either get dissuaded by that or really interrogate and analyze what's really going on. What's really going on? We're growing. Like we're growing. And these are like elements of a growing pain. Because you're not always going to agree with each other. And that's okay. Right? That's okay. And it should be okay if sometimes it's to say, you know, if, if you've got one way that you want to do it and i got another way I want to do it, let them, let them bloom. Let, you know, let's check in in the year and see which one is working well and which one is, you know, maybe not. Hopefully they're both working well. And we learn a lot from both of them that we combine on a higher level of synergy to move some things forward, right? Uh, but in the, in the context of, you know, real political struggle, and I think having some, you know, we exist on a level where our decisions actually make an impact on other people's lives. All of our decisions do, but, you know, it's a different responsibility, say, for, for uh, for me and the, and the responsibility I bear, because I'm at a, in a place where some of my decisions impact actually a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand people. So to me, it's incumbent that I get it right, because it's not just a personal decision anymore. Like, what I do actually has an impact on what other people's, like the quality of their life and what may happen. And that's the level that, you know, we exist with, like, the People's Assembly, but particularly now with, with the... Uh, with the mayorship in the political arena, right? And so some of the struggles around, hey, we have to get this right, number one, because you don't get this many chances to do things over again. Number two, we should be mindful of the lessons of history and the dynamics and the questions that we're struggling with. They're not, some of them are unique in context, but the fundamental question of, you know, who's gonna win, capital or the people? That's fought everywhere. Right? And then how do we negotiate as a movement where we and will we compromise and where we won't? Right? Uh, and to understand that, you know, and the, and the thing I think we have been a bit stronger at in the past uh, was that we were very clear because we had the time in, in some respects. Um, we were much more clear, I would say, four years ago on what the limits of compromise that we, will, we had collectively agreed to accept. This time around, particularly with the electoral arena, we weren't able to do that to the same degree. Uh, and for, for one reason was, you know, when, when, uh, where the subjective stuff is important and you have to pay attention to it. So, you know, when, when Chokwe passed, that really impacted a couple of our core people quite a bit. And some of those folks just had to take off, you know, and they were gone for a while. Uh, but in their absence, you know, things, certain things moved on, but they weren't around and we weren't around to the same degree that we were five and six and seven years ago to be thinking and strategizing with each other about what's the, the road forward. And one of the things that I, I know I was bringing to the table was like, you, we can't approach 2017 in the same way we approached 2013. Because to the extent that, you know, we have moved, they've also moved. They've also learned. Like, they didn't stand still four years. It's like we didn't stand still. 
and the other side of the equation has far more power and resources than we do. And so, you know, uh, on, on the one level, and I don't think I've said this other ways, it's, you know, it's public, I really didn't think that we should have run for the mayoral ship in, in 2017 because the economic conditions in Jackson are far worse than they were in 2013. Like our city has been in debt for most of the last couple of years. And debt means that you have to manage, if, when you find yourself in debt on that level of running municipality, the common way in which you have to do that under the present global conditions, and these are global conditions, not just local, is you have to, what, impose austerity as a way of squeezing from yourself the way out, which then shrinks the public sphere and the public options of what you can pursue. So I was saying, look, we, we already got folks that are furloughed. The economy is, is, is shrinking intentionally, not like this has just happened unobjectively or unintentionally. Intentionally, this has happened. We could be set up to where we have to then manage the austerity, and then we have to explain to the people, you know, why are you not getting this or why are we cutting that? And do we want to be in that position? Right? Do we want to be in that position? And I was arguing and still argue that's not a position that the left should try to adopt. Right? That's not a position that we should try to adopt. Um, you know, because we've seen this role. Anybody who's followed the, the course of social democracy in Europe the last 50 years, we've seen this before. It's not like this is a new phenomenon. It's new in certain ways, maybe for us in the left, because we haven't been in government <laughs> to any significant degree here in the United States. But it's not a new phenomenon. So it was like, let's run for city council, and then we could fight from a more strategic position there. That was a minority position. You know, so we, we granted from that, and I think we look, but the the critical, you know, looking forward, I think the critical position uh, now that I'm speaking to is, okay, you know, m my comrade is there. Uh, how, in the midst of this austerity, how can we still create a certain condition that the overall program can be moved? That is the, the point that we're at now. And I think the maturity is, it is my job to represent the left position and the struggle from a left base to create as much space for him to move as possible. And sometimes that's not pretty, but that's the way it has to be, right? Um, you know, it would be much easier if we were like, you know, always chum chum, but I'm like, look, hey brother, I I'm coming down there to raise hell, you know, uh, down to City Hall to raise hell, because I have to. If I don't do it, or if somebody else doesn't do it, that means the Chamber of Commerce is dictating the terms and there's no counter, right? And they don't play nice. You can at least talk to me, right? You know, at the end of the day, they're going to tell you, look, you either do it my way or these little businesses that you depended upon, I'm moving them to Rankin County. Like, that's how the game is played. You know, so like either you're going to give me what I want well, I'm taking my little toys, I'm taking my capital investment, and I'm leaving. That means the job leaves, that means the tax base leaves. So if there's no other counter, then that's who, what ultimately you're going to have to bend to. Like, that's the real politics, right? Um, and then I think it's just a point of maturity that we have to, to, to grow and understand in the context of strategy, which is coming back to those key questions, right? Like, where are we trying to go, and what do we agree on how do we get there? That's a fundamental question. Uh, now, I submit that, and I'll end on this. Just as I'm loving uh, uh, this period in Jackson, you know, because I think it's sharpen, uh, sharpening up clarity for the next 10 years for us in a, in, to a certain extent, because I think, the, you know, my, my piece around loving it is that this little road, this kind of little bump in the road is actually getting ready for some major struggles, which is to come. Like, this ain't nothing yet. There's some other stuff that's coming down the road. And so this is, you know, this is helping us to sharpen ourselves up, sharpen our thinking up. But I'm loving, to a certain extent, uh, what's going on on the national level. And I hope all of you see what's going on now in part as an opportunity, right? Because, you know, one thing about 45, he's making everything pretty clear, <laughs> right? I mean, you know. It's clear, like, I'm, I'm coming to rob you, you know. My tax plan is going to hurt you, 
right? I'm squeezing everything I can squeeze. Me and my partners who go, you know, our, my golfing buddies mm -hmm. are going to, we're we going to have a field day taking even more from, from you and everybody else. Um, I'm going to destroy the environment. You know, I'm going to destroy public education. You know, I'm going to destroy public housing. You know, he's just making it clear, like, this is the, this is the thing that's going on. So then it becomes a question for us. We can either continue doing it the way we've been doing it or figure out how to do it differently and we start by asking different questions. Because I think the thing with him is that certain illusions are just being eroded very quickly, right? So like one to me, like I'll ask the question of, of you know, I keep hearing at least this branding of resistance from folks who are supposed to be on the other side of the, the aisle you know, and supposed to represent a different view. Um, how does Mike Pompeo, you know, get confirmed that quickly? That's just one example. It's like, well, well, where is this resistance? Where, where, you know, like what? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And it's either like, well, either I can wait or I can build something that's an alternative. That's a question that we have to Posed to ourselves, right? Like I can't wait for them people to make up their mind that they're gonna actually stop war. You know, I can't really wait on that. I can't wait on those folks to, you know, decide that 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 they don't think climate change is real. Like I can't wait on that. I have to build something which addresses the actual climate crisis, with or without their approval, with or without their support, because it's required. It's what's necessary for us to survive. And I don't need their permission to do that, to do anything, you know? So that's the energy that I'm hoping that we, we move with, right? And that we build with collectively. Uh, and remember, we need y'all. So please answer these questions. Thank you. Democracy and uh, really, in my in my opinion, plays um, the holder of militant strategy in organizing Boston for many of us. Um, and, I, and I say this, you know, because Lisa, Lisa, I've said this before when I was just introducing her. But when 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 I have a question or I'm not sure, one of the people that I want to know what their take on is Lisa. And Lisa will let you know. <laughs> And, and I know what to do. Um, but it comes from a, a deep commitment to education, base building, but also coalition building. And, and really, I will say when we were starting UJIMA, which um, Nia is the director of and we'll introduce in a sec, Lisa was one of the first people who was a community organizer who was in the trenches and saw what this vision was about and embraced it um, in a way that I think, you know, we may or may not be where we are if it weren't for your creativity. And so I'm just really grateful to Lisa. Chuck Turner, um, who should need no introduction if you listen to the Foundation Movement. Uh, what is it? Nat and Chuck Turner's, right? We have some yeah. shout outs to Chuck. Um, Chuck is a mentor for many of us, uh, and I'm very grateful to get to say so for myself as well. Um, Chuck, as you all know, was a city councilor for over a decade for District 7 and Roundtable. Um, I think probably has been called all kinds of things, but one of my favorite is the most radical elected official in the United States of America, which I think is true at the moment. Um, and, and Chuck also, though, has a long history as a, as a cooperative business developer in, in all kinds of aspects of things that really, you know, the solidarity economy work that we're talking about, he's been engaged in for decades. And so um, it's nice for this work to sort of come back around. Uh, next is Nia Evans, who is a great friend and colleague and is the director of the Boston Ujima Project. So, you know, sometimes there's, there's times when people come, come along and they were the answer that you didn't even know you had the question for. I think that Nia was that person for the Boston Ujima Project. U Ujima was trying to become this community control vision of a new economy. Um, that was rooted in, in low-income and working-class communities of Boston. Um, and Nia was at the Boston NAAC, NAACT, uh, NAACP as the executive director when we first met. And um, 
kind of similar to, to Lisa actually, like saw the saw the vision kind of immediately and was able to start um, bringing the NAACP, who you know many of us know um, has not always been you know on the edge of fighting for maybe a history, but more recently anyway, you know has not been on the edge of pushing for an alternative economy or a liberatory politics per se. Um, but Nia was in this position, able to engage with so many parts of the community and, and saw what this vision was about, stepped in and has been our director and has helped launch this incredible organization that I'm also very fortunate to get to be affiliated with. So this is an incredible group of people and of course we all just started calling you. Comrades. So, uh, what we're going to do is actually, I asked each of the four respondents to just share a little bit more about their actual work because I think that, uh, as Kali said, many of the aspects of the ecosystem that you have in Jackson, we also do have here, and I think this is an amazing representation of some of that cross-section. So we want you to hear about the organization, the work that they're doing, and how they're thinking about this just transition from capitalism to a solidarity economy in the very specific context of work that you're doing. Uh, and then, Kali, I'll ask you to do sort of a quick reflection after you hear them, and then we have one more quick round, and then we're just going to open it up for the rest of the session. So, um, I'd like to start with Lisa, if that's okay. Okay, so thank you. that we have. 
and, um, and I appreciate the challenge to us to, um, in our work, that the next phase of our work is to um, not just develop these shared analysis of our current conditions, which I think pockets of us certainly, um, the, the leadership has been doing, right? In order to create campaigns, we have to analyze our current conditions and then make strategic decisions about what to do about that. But to really um, uh, deepen our muscle um, through people's assemblies to, to, to do that kind of very deep shared analysis. Um, I really appreciate that and it really, I think, um, uh, reinforces a lot of our a lot of our conversation internally about how do we uh, how do we build this movement um, how do we build a movement that doesn't get um, discouraged when we lose individual battles um, but and also that gives us energy because we are fighting so defensively all the time um, so so I think I, I just want to step back for a minute and say that um, so so I'm the executive director of City Life, and City Life, um, our work is is both defensive, um, and and we are connected to this um, more expansive build. So if you think about resisting the bad and building the new, we are very firmly in the resisting the bad piece, right? So people come to us because um, they are losing their their homes, they're they're being kicked out of their apartments, um, and. Why are they losing their homes and being kicked out of apartments? Because in this particular moment, the capitalists have decided that they want their city back. So they fled, right? We, we, we know the history of how capital comes in and out of the city. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly after the foreclosure crisis, there was, it seems to be, a consensus that the time was right to, to, to take the land and the, and, uh, and the wealth that was extracted from communities of color, and make no mistake, we fought tooth and nail to own our homes. Mm -hmm. There were no, no one was lining up to give us, you know, the, the, the you know, A rates, you know, prime mortgages. Yeah. We, we had the worst loans in the, in, um, in, you know, the, the homes that had, that needed the most repair, you know, in the neighborhoods that had been historically disinvested in, and we created our communities. We, our communities, we have both, our communities are people who have been around for 40 years. 40, 50 years of building, um, uh, uh, building their ability to be homeowners and their, um, and as renters, right? So we built this community. So now that the capitalists want to take our, their land, they want to take our land away from us, the defensive work is critically important. So we fight house by house, unit by unit. We, uh, we, we create the conditions for people to, um, to, to transcend from this is my shame into this is our collective fight. And we do that through community organizing, we do that through, um, through, through building really solid relationships between uh, neighbors and renters and homeowners, um, and, and by uh, using tenant organizing struggles to force elected and public officials to take the side of the people. So each of these, of these defensive battles are important because it helps people to stay in their homes, but it's also important because politically we're saying, you can't have this. You've made this, de this decision and you have the money, you think you have the money to do it, but you're going, every time you try this, you are always going to face resistance. And that's the message uh, in our organizing. Um, and we know that even that's not enough, right? Because there will always be another building there's always going to be another struggle, and we will never give up, right? We, um, but it, but we know that we're not just in a defensive fight. We are in a fight for um, social ownership, community control, true democratic decision making over the over the decisions that impact our lives, and ultimately towards systemic transformation, right? So so we're we're fighting for the time when 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 there are no capitalists who can decide to come in and out of, of our communities at will, right? Um, and so I think the, the last thing that I want to say is, um, 
kind of what, where I see is next in our struggle, and what we've been talking about is um, uh, deepening our relationship with with the build part of the defend and build, right? So, so for us, that means you know supporting the infrastructure for these um, for these new solidarity economy projects to emerge. So that means you know being able to provide the infrastructure for the Ujima project to get up and running, to help find funders, to have meeting spaces, to create to to share our networks, right? So that this so that this am amazing emerging project can actually thrive and survive on its own. Um, uh, another way that the, that, that, that the deepening happens is through um, uh, helping to create a community land trust that, uh, that, that came out of the foreclosure crisis where homeowners and tenants together decided to fight with former homeowners that were fighting the banks to say, no, you can't take this home you, you can't take it from the from the person, and you can't take it from the community. Um, and then once we wrested control, and every single unit, we have 15 units now, every single unit was a fight. But once we wrested control from the banks, we said, now we have to learn how to govern ourselves. Now that it's on a community land trust, that's a whole new set of skills that we need, and we have to we have to take our fighting hats off because we're just going to be fighting each other now. <laughs> So, so that there's 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 work that um, uh, although we're not developers, we're a community organization. We have a responsibility to help people develop the to develop the skills to 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 think and act collectively together. And so that's um, that's City Life's role, and that's the role of Right to the City, I think, as well. Um, so, and then the, the the last piece is really supporting. Um, uh, the city and all of our partners to do people's assemblies in ways that are more than just, um, Kelly was saying um, earlier, you know, we, we don't want to just, we don't want to have a one-way conversation with people. We really do have to build the muscle of, of, of thinking about, so one, transcending, this is, this is the thing that I care about, right? But thinking about um, do it, you know, how do you analyze the current situation, the current uh, historic political moment right now? How do you, how do you, how do you assess the balance of forces, right? What does that even mean? You know, how do we have principled struggle and debate together for the purpose of saying, this is where we want to go, and, and then how do you create some experiments to test out what you think? you should be doing, right? So these are the kinds of conversations that, again, we've been having in smaller circles, but we need to elevate the conversation and develop the capacity for, for all of us to do this at a citywide level. So, um, so that's just some of what we've been thinking about. Great, thank you. So much. Mia would like you to ask you to go next. Um, one small thing, Sarah, could you be a timer for us? And once they hit maybe five minutes, just flash. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mia Evans, and I'm with Boston Ujima Project. And I will uh, try my best to give a short overview of Ujima, and then uh, res um, respond with, with some, some thoughts and some learnings. So, um, Ujima Swahili for Collective Work and Responsibility, Boston Ujima Project, much like uh, Cooperation Jackson, uh, is experimenting with the ecosystem approach um, to transforming our way of being. Um, and we are experimenting with an ecosystem approach um, because there was one of, the, one of the learnings from a study group that was convened by City Life in Urbana. Center for Economic Democracy and Boston Impact Initiative, which is a local impact investment firm here, um, was that uh, conventional responses, which were often singular in a particular sector, um, were impactful, uh, but their impact was probably limited by, by their singularity. And so uh, there was something to explore with taking some of the things that we know about, like cooperatives, alternative currency, time banking, uh, participatory decision making and putting them together uh, to see um, 
if by working in concert with each other, each particular uh, innovation or intervention um, could be made more impactful. And then the whole thing is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and an ecosystem approach also because we understanding that we are dealing with systemic issues. Um, and so probably, you know, a way to, to deal with the system is probably systemically. Um, so what are the parts of our ecosystem really quickly? Um, the center is our, what we call our general assembly, our governing body, which is our membership body. Um, and it is our commitment that Ujima is an organization, even though we have staff, and we have staff that have titles and, uh, you know, we, we do some daily decision making. Um, ultimately, we do want Ujima to be an organization that is co-created by our governing body, by our general uh, assembly. So we do consider that a, a key feature, and so that's something I'm going to come to uh, later when I think about uh, what, we can, what we can learn back and forth between Jackson and Boston. Uh, another feature is our fund. So the idea is our general body also has the option to invest in a fund. So our general body has the option to, we, we will pull our resources together into a fund. Um, and uh, Lisa talked about the role of, of capital and capitalists and uh, the capitalists making the decisions and thinking, for example, that they, they have enough money to kind of uh, uh, dismiss what our priorities are and the decisions that we would like to make. And um, this is not necessarily fighting capital with capital, but it's, it's, it's recognizing it isn't just might or it isn't just size um, that, that has power. Uh, power can be derived. Uh, many ways, and so this is looking at a, another type of way to derive power together. And so uh, members can invest in a fund, non-members can invest in a fund, and one of the things that's really important about this fund is that the decision making, again, resides with our members. Members vote on how that fund gets allocated, and that vote is not dependent on how much you've invested. So again, uh, taking, a, taking another look at the correlation between wealth and power the correlation between wealth and voice, the correlation between wealth and decision making, and, and breaking that, that straight line. Um, and so that's very important as well. Not only that, uh, our members are also determining the standards by which uh, people who receive investments must abide. Um, and so we, we have expectations, and, and we do have certain types of uh, businesses, certain types of community initiatives that we want to support, and this makes me think. This makes me think of Kali's point about you know, you might want to tell uh, you know some of the races, you know, we're not we're not doing this together right now, for example. So we're very clear about that. So we're clear that there are certain types of entrepreneurs that we want to support. Um, we want to support entrepreneurs and uh, businesses um, that are run by people of color, that are working class communities of color, and we do have a screen on top of that where we are looking at what the impact is um, in our communities. And so we're very clear about that and, we, and we're uh, making sure that that's incorporated in our investment decisions. I'm getting the one minute uh, warning, so I'll go, to, I'll go to the learnings. I can go a little over, okay. Um, <laughs> But, and actually I can't stop here because those, those are two primary features and, and then I would just say the ecosystem approach is then thinking about what surrounds that, um, again, to make it as strong as possible. So we have a business alliance, we have a technical assistance network, we're looking at, we're, we're uh, developing a time banking network, we're looking at alternative currency, etc. Um, so I think there are probably two or three things that I'm thinking about in response to uh, Colin's remarks. Um, so one is, as I said, the assembly is a primary feature of Eugene. We are working together with uh, Right to the City um, on our assemblies. And when I think about um, why Eugene is important, um, so I think Eugene is important, and when I think of defend and build, we're clearly in that build category. And so when I think about uh, what Eugene provides, um, it is directing some of the capacity that already exists in our communities um, into uh, efforts that are inspiring, that are productive, uh, that, are, that are creative, and that are, that are rejuvenating. And so this makes me think about the capacity piece. So first is thinking about um, recognizing the capacity that is already there and directing it away from, and this is, this is uh, what was so compelling about Eugene when I was at NAACP, um, a lot of the work that we were doing was the kind of conventional, you know, go to a hearing, testify, 
show up, talk to five white guys, tell them your story, you know, hope they're sympathetic, and you know, hope the decision goes your way. Um, and at a certain point, it just it just kind of felt irresponsible to keep asking people to just show up that way. And um, you could kind of see powerlessness and frustration building. So just to say, the capacity is there. People vote, people protest, people testify, uh, people show up, people have solutions. Um, there, there's a question about um, how many places is it for there to go to. Um, so, so that's one thing. So I think these, these assemblies um, are very important for people to show up with what they have. And then, then there's the piece about then, then further developing that capacity. And so that's important. So uh, building up, building on whatever it is that we are bringing uh, to make decisions. And again, here's just where I'm going to repeat, Lisa, um, to to be deliberative, uh, to examine, um, and to uh, learn, and then do it again. And so I guess this is this is this is the last thing. I have no idea what's happening with my time, but this is the last thing. Um, I also think about context. So Holly talked about Jackson's context, and uh, th this morning he said one of the rep the, the things about Jackson's context that we might not want to replicate um, is, you know, I guess we could say Trump, um, if, I, if I could do an analogy, um, the, the, the state of the nation is it, is, could, could be, we could see a microcosm of that in Jackson, is what I would say, where it's clear. So where you're saying Trump is so uh, just outrageous that some things are undeniable. There, there are conditions in Jackson that are, that are hard to deny. It's hard to have a debate. Um, that is not necessarily the case in Boston. Um, and what is also the case in Boston is, um, there is there is this history of these incredible fights and these incredible trials and these incredible experiments. And as with a lot of, a lot of places, we've heard about Black Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, this extreme violence um, in response. And so that memory is there. And so it's also important, I think, to be able to, to, be able to take um, the ability to, to use inspirational work to say, yes, I know for some people who are here, they've seen this before. And they've, they've been in these situations before where, where, it's, where it seems like things were gonna be, it seemed like things were gonna be different. And then there was this response. Um, and so there, there could be a temptation to say, why try? Um, and so again, I think the assemblies are a good place, to, a good place for people to, to do that trial um, and to uh, experience humps, get over the humps, do it again, um, and, and know that it could be different. Okay, so uh, I'd like to pass it over to Chuck now. Uh, so Chuck, um, We'll talk about whatever you want. <laughs> you know? uh, well, let me uh, just uh, say how, how pleased and honored I am to uh, be with you, Colleen. I uh, was a, a particularly appreciative of your going back to the uh, Republic of New Africa and how that related to what you're doing in Jackson today because uh, I had the honor uh, in, I think, 71, uh, in the early 70s, of uh, meeting with the Henry brothers as they uh, came from Detroit here to Boston to spread the word about what was going on in Mississippi. And I think Chokwe came um, uh, with them on that and uh, talked about his, you know, his vision of what could be built. And so to see uh, 50, almost 50 years later, uh, those, those thoughts and discussions that were uh, just beginning to emerge in the, in the 70s now uh, being rooted and being the basis for moving forward just um, reaffirms the thought that uh, what's important is that we have visions and we hold on to the visions because when we have a vision and we keep our focus on mental, emotional, spiritual uh, focus on that vision, it becomes the, uh, the new reality. So really thank you for being here with us and, uh, for that movement that uh, uh, is now manifesting what we used to hear about here in Boston uh, in the early uh, early 70s. I want to talk uh, just briefly about uh, two things. What uh, the work I'm doing with uh, an organization called the Boston uh, Jobs Clearinghouse and talking Ooh. about um, yeah, yeah, you can do that. It's it's worth it. Uh, but also talk about um, uh, another 
a, a kind of a thought or vision that relates to the question of our building uh, an economy out of our own thoughts uh, and uh, inspiration and energies. But the Boston Jobs Coalition was formed, uh, it's, it's a second formation, actually it was initially formed back in 1976 when uh, there was a, a realization that uh, people of color had to join with uh, the white community uh, here in Boston to fight for our share of the construction industry because while people of color were being blamed for taking jobs away from white workers, we you know, realized that that wasn't true. Uh, and when 2,000 white workers who were from the suburbs marched on City Hall and demanded the end of the Third World Jobs Clearinghouse, which had started uh, with city funds to uh, move this uh, process of sharing forward, um, you know, just realized that there had to be uh, an alliance uh, that uh, ended the ability of uh, those who were in power uh, to divide us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and actually that, uh, that alliance uh, led to a point where a uh, policy uh, was taken to the Supreme Court that said that uh, affirmative residency, regardless of race, uh, would be coupled with uh, affirmative action for workers of color and women uh, it went to the Supreme Court. It um, was uh, ruled constitutional by a uh, Republican court. Rehnquist uh, said that mayors have the right to establish policies that maintain the public peace. And so it, it laid a foundation. But here we were um, 40, some 40 years later, and the uh, ordinance uh, had been weakened. Uh, there wasn't as much um, uh, there wasn't as much push on the part of the city uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, and so there, the Boston Jobs Coalition uh, saw a need to uh, rewrite the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So he said, we can't wait around for uh, one minute. Okay, um, well, <laughs> let, let, me, uh, let, me, let me just make it uh, much, much quicker and uh, <laughs> just say that we had fought on the, uh, fought on for a jobs policy that would be stronger and we were able to raise the percentage for people of color from 25% to 40% that we think is much stronger. Uh, we now have an ordinance going forward that would put the focus on the unions and the supply of workers and our uh, get it, making sure we the unions uh, are required uh, in certain ways to uh, increase their share of the work for workers of color Boston residents and women. Uh, we also are working on the development of a uh, ordinance sit that would citywide establish uh, new standards for any business that was uh, getting resources uh, from the uh, from the city of Boston, and that those uh, standards would require a starting wage of twenty-two dollars an hour. Uh, people say hey, you can't get it. Uh, other we, the organization says. Uh, we can't get anything that we don't struggle for, but we have to begin to uh, push for uh, what we think is possible, even if others think it's impossible. We'll end just by saying that, that we see the work we're doing and trying to improve the quality of life within the system that's here now, but that we also have, my perspective is we have a need to uh, build the new system. How do we build the new system here in Massachusetts? I think we have an incredible opportunity. It is now legal to grow industrial hemp. You can, the, the, the male part of the cannabis family. Uh, marijuana is a, is a plant that will, is the uh, female part of the cannabis family that uh, provides a variety of uh, health and, and uh, values. Industrial hemp is the basis of an infinite set of products. Yes. You can mix everything yes. from uh, cl clothing yep. to furniture to rope uh, to uh, lotion to yep. construction materials. It is phenomenal. Google industrial hemp. I think you will be surprised. It's now legal to grow it in Massachusetts which means that there's much more ability to develop economy around different uh, products that we could make from it. 
So I think we need to begin to think about uh, establishing land bases here in Massachusetts yes. where uh, those of us who feel we're stuck in the cities uh, can go out to those land bases, begin to build a community, and to work particularly with uh, industrial hemp uh, because I think it has so many, um, gives us so many opportunities to really bring out our creative spirit, our developmental spirit, and show ourselves in the world the uh, creativity that is within us all. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, what, what, what I think we'll have is after Elena, you, you go. Um, <laughs> uh, I think what I'll actually ask is a few people who want to share some questions, and then we'll get them in, and then we'll let Polly respond and kind of, y'all can just kind of finish it off. All right. Sounds good. So that's genius, Chuck. Uh, Maguey. That's what we call it in Spanish. Okay, so to your great questions, Kali, of where are we headed and how are we going to get there, I want to add a third one, which is who are we? Who are you? Who am I? Okay, because I think that this make America great again is called war. We know that somebody that looks like me ain't American. Okay, so, or from here. So I want to start by telling you that neighbor or neighbor defines the who are we, not around a specific uh, race or immigration status or anything like that, but around the recognition that as black and brown, as immigrants, as women, as working class, we are facing a common enemy called two enemies, two evils, capitalism and systems of oppression. That's what brings us together. We are a dimension that understands that actually we are quite smart, quite beautiful, quite all that, and that the reason why things are not so good in our communities has nothing to do with who we are, but everything to do with the fact that power is not in our hands. Therefore, we are engaged in that contestation of power so that where are we headed? We are headed to a place where we are the ones in power. We are governing. I love the idea of the self-governing. And that's where we are headed eventually. Okay? Uh, how do we get there? Uh, in, in the ecosystem of the solidarity economy, uh, a neighbor neighbor is not yet creating the alternative economic models. And I say not yet because we have a chapter in Holyoke where we do hope to take over and have our own co-op, land trust, you know, solar panels, uh, be the mayors and everything else because the question of scale that you mentioned earlier, we believe that Holyoke is a, is a, is a small town that can give us that chance. But in the meantime, we are in the organization at the Solidarity Economic Initiative that is constantly asking the question, well, what is the role of government right now in building and supporting the Solidarity Economic Initiative? Because uh, it is great to have a land trust here and there, but they continue to be small and by and large private. And let me, let me, let me underscore that, private initiatives. Right, that are primarily being funded by great people, don't get me wrong, but they're still private. And we know that uh, right now there's no much solidarity going on. A neighbor to neighbor, we define them, we define solidarity as I am well if you're well. Like that to us is solidarity. And we know that that is not the world that we're living in. However, however uh, corrupt government is, the only place right now where there is a, a, a however corrupt expression of the public good is government. That is the place where decisions are getting made uh, as to how our taxes, my friends, are being used. So we think that that is a very important arena of engagement. And so uh, I will be concluding very quickly that there are two areas of engagement in that arena. One is, of course, policy. And the question again is, how do we start shifting our resources, right, from boring uh, a work development type programs to co-op development, right? How do we start shifting some of those resources from the things that we know are not working to the new initiatives, okay? Uh, in the area of policy, how do we start creating the kinds of alliances with the city life uh, of the world 
and the regular cities of the world statewide so we can make rent control happen. Those are things that are happening in the area of right, right of, of government, of foreign policy that complement the idea of land trust really, really well. So lastly, there's the electoral arena. How much, how many of us love that, right? Oh, we are, talk about context, right? We are in the boring state of uh, the bastion of the Democratic Party. Hmm? We have a, a, a state legislature that is filled with corporate Dems. Okay? We live under the illusion that everything is actually pretty okay in the state of Massachusetts because we have all those corporate Dems and to still, sorry, a, a, a liberal, a white, liberal, white power structure. Things are not good. And that's why they're kicking us out of our cities, okay? So we ignore that area, in, in our opinion, neighbor our neighbor, at our own peril. However, I told you, we are smart. So we don't engage the electoral politics as electoral politics as usual, because we do have to ask the new questions, okay? So for us, the electoral arm is not an end in itself, but it is an organizing tool. It is a power building tool. We are not here to be electing the worst of the two evils. Mm -hmm. no. We are here to elect us, okay? And we are not here like, oh my God, if we don't win, we're not gonna do it. Yes, we are gonna do it. Because at the very least, we're gonna be out there telling our stories and shifting our narrative. You're gonna have to deal with somebody like me, for example, okay? <laughs> And so I am going to end by giving you a very, very quick example of this, putting it all together. Last year, uh, in, in the city of Lynn, uh, I see Estrella somewhere, uh, there you go. In the city of Lynn, we're beginning to experiment what Bozo was experimenting a decade ago, okay? And so we're trying to pass the silliest thing called inclusionary zoning. Right. Right, that is not transformational, folks. Well, guess what? Nobody in city council would touch that because everybody's very happy with the developers coming into town. Everybody wants that. So nobody wants to touch inclusionary zoning. So this is our neighbor. Okay, we're gonna elect one of us. And so we put forth uh, Marvin Ippolit, a beautiful 25-year-old son of Haitian immigrants, okay? That was out there and he knocked on doors on our message, his message, because his own mom is about to be displaced, okay? So, did we win the election? No! No! But we got like 47% of the vote. Wow. Woo! Wow. So the following day, hey, Marvin was like the star, right? With people wanting to sit down with him and calling him the downtown candidate because we only lost one precinct, the primarily white, more well-off uh, precinct. But the downtown precincts that are the ones that are facing imminent displacement, they voted for Marvin and our candidate. So that is our vision, that is our hope, and that is who we are in the Solidarity Economic Initiative future. Thank you. Okay, so who's feeling inspired, questions, things burning? My name is Mickey, and um, I loved what you said about you have to get off Facebook. <laughs> because you do. And uh, there is a network called Mastodon that has an instance called social.coop, where it's cooperative and we all pay like even a dollar a month. I'd like to ask, how do you brilliant people who have huge networks think that could be done? Could there be like a campaign to mass move people off of Facebook or just use Facebook to point to another place that is equitable? Great, thank you, Mickey. Who else has a question? Yes. Hi, uh, this question is kind of more so for Kali. I'm curious what the relationship now is between cooperation in Jackson and uh, the city government and what power uh, you all have to like move them the way you want or not. Excellent, cool, thank you. And, um, yep. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I work at a public high school in, uh, in Boston. We serve students who have dropped out of school primarily or students that are disengaged. Um, and we're working through a redesign of our school. And we're finding that looking at our data that our men of color are not graduating at rates that we want and this, even within this population. So I'm wondering what you guys think education should look like um, for everyone, but specifically for men of color. Awesome. All right. So I'm sure there are other questions, but I am going to cut it there. Um, so yes, Kali would love for you to kind of just open-ended reflections. There's some specific questions and thoughts that came up, or really whatever you're moved to address, and then we'll just have um, some final closing thoughts from everyone. Hey, I'm of two minds. Um, uh, one, I, I want to make some more connections. So let me see if I can do that real quick. Um, uh, so you mentioned the Henry Brothers, which you know the the uh, um, the Obadelli brothers is also they adopted the name uh, Gaidi and Amari Obadelli, and uh, Amari primarily was the I would say the central political um, mentor of Chokwe Lumumba, right? Um, and uh, if it was not for the Amari brothers, the ballot to the bullet and the message to the grassroots speeches by Malcolm X, most of y'all probably would have never heard of them. Okay? They organized the events in Detroit that he went to and gave those two speeches with his organiza their organization called Gold, right, at the time, uh, which was a was been part of the vision of RAM, the Revolutionary Action Movement. Now, Malcolm X has direct ties here folks remember. And if it wasn't for his auntie, we probably would have never known Malcolm X, who lived here, right? Uh, and who saw in him and made some investment in him when other people was willing to kind of throw him away, going back to your, your point about education. And even when he was in prison, she was the main person who was sending him information, you know, to further his, his education. So bringing these things uh, uh, up, that I think is important because, you know, for us, one thing that uh, I should reflect back all uh, to you is one of the critical things about 20 years ago when, when a group of us started first looking at uh, uh, particularly a deeper dive into community land trust, W Street Initiative was the first thing that got brought to our attention. Right? Um, you know, so how we, uh, our, our little experiments all over the place, they matter uh, and they're important. And I think the main thing is about us taking ourselves in the work. Important is one thing I just want to stress again, if I didn't stress that earlier. Uh, now real briefly on, on um, some of the questions to honor that. Uh, number one, um, can there be a campaign to migrate to other places? Of course they can. Uh, should there be a migration, a plan to migrate to other places? In my view, yes. Does that mean totally of, at this stage necessarily abandoning Facebook? In my view, no. Uh, because there's still several million people or some 70 million people or something. I think they're talking about it still on the, on the, on the piece. I think the, the campaign of how you utilize that tool, recognizing its limitations, <clears throat> has to be organized and still push for mass engagement there as much as possible. You know, but putting, you know, you know, where you are and what you're eating, uh, that, leave that alone. You know, that's just more information that uh, is being calculated against you, you know, by the algorithms that are, that are uh, determining, you know, what toothpaste you should buy and what advertising is going to be directed your way. Um, so I think it's how we use these things, how we utilize these tools uh, are important, but us creating our own tools should not be underestimated and should not be taken lightly if they're not as you know, sexy or flashy. Us having our own is very important, so don't underestimate that. Uh, I was a teacher for about 10 years, and you know, one of the things um, that 
led me on the path that I am now was actually being a teacher in that very question that you asked. So uh, I was in Oakland, California for almost nine years. And in that time, uh, you know, working with some folks, we created a school. Uh, there was a policy that cre got created called a new small autonomous schools policy. Um, modeled after things primarily here on the East Coast that got brought to the West Coast. Primarily, we, the, the big thing that they were looking at that time was, was New York City before they abolished that kind of program. So they got brought to, the, to, to California, we fought for it, we helped implement it, and we, you know, a group of us started the school. And the school was intentionally for high school students who had been dropped out or kicked out or who were on probation or on parole. And so we had 120 students that we recruited. We came up with our own you know, code. And the part of the thing about this process was it was kind of like the best of both worlds to an extent of we had like almost all of the, the freedoms that you allegedly have with, with a charter school about setting your own curriculum and hiring your own staff, we had that. But we were fully integrated into the public school system, which I am a defender of, and, and, and all our folks had all of their union seniority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, within it. So it was kind of like the best of both worlds, because my, my problem was with, primarily with the curriculum, you know, uh, uh, and then how things are administered, and who has power to administer what and how. So, um, The one of the major life crisis for me was I put, you know, everything I had for two years before the school, you know, uh, came into being. Probably some of the best organizing work. I had to pat myself on the back for that one. I, I busted my ass to, to build that school. And the the first week when it opened, I just woke up in a mad panic. I never had any any, any experience like that. Just woke up in the middle of the night, just drenching with sweat. And I was like, you know, I recruited all these kids and I promised them, you know, and I believed that I could get them to go to college. And I believe I could prepare them to graduate from college, but ain't no jobs for them. So I'm like, I'm setting these kids up for failure. They didn't they just really get me. So it was like, you know, what is the future of the black working class was the central question that woke me up, right? Because capital's clearly saying, we don't have a need for y'all no more, period. And you're just a problem that we're in search of a solution for, you know. Uh, uh, and they've been doing various experiments. This whole 30-year experiment with mass incarceration, you know, that that was a piece of we don't have no jobs for you. We ain't trying to create no jobs for you. How well would this warehousing do, or how well would some other things do? You know, I think genocide, from what we learned, and I'm not saying that lightly from the Katrina experience, is a serious thing that's put on the on the on the equation. And I'm not saying that lightly because of here, per se, but we got to recognize this program is already being executed on a global scale. We just don't talk about it. That's right. Yes. Right? So we may be the canary in the American mind, but, you know, the whole, just look at what they're doing in Yemen right now. If that ain't genocide and the wholesale destruction of a country on our watch, then we ain't hardly having no conversation about it. Like, just sit, sit with that for a minute. Um, you know, because we're responsible for that, y'all, to a certain extent. Because it's the, our government, this money, and all the stuff that is allowing that to happen. You know, so we got to tap into some serious anti-imperialist reflexes ourselves and figure out, well, how do we, you know, get, how do we stop that? How do we intervene in that to the best extent possible? And that's not the only place, you know. Uh, they all over Africa now, they, you know, uh, Palestine is getting worse and worse. Uh, anyway, um, the question that you raise about the relationship, I would say it's a right relationship. It's a right relationship. Um, it is the job of the social movements to be the ultimate arbitrators of power, not the electoral, you know, uh, uh, vehicles. Not electoral vehicles, and so uh, I, you know, the the government and what we aim to do there was a tool. And I'm gonna say that you know, from up front, this is Kali. I'm not asking you to believe in what I believe in. I don't have no faith, no belief, no allegiance to the United States government anywhere, any form, any fashion. Period. I'm not trying to build it up. I'm not trying to reinforce it. 
you know, I'm not trying to, 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 to ultimately change it. So to me, the engagement is I have to deal with the power that exists on the best terms that, that are. That is a strategy that, you know, for us in, our, in the context of Jackson, yep. that was just a means to help move some particular things that come from the social movement forward. If it helps us to do that, great. If it doesn't help us to do that, we can leave it alone. And, and need to leave it alone, right? And find the other vehicles or build the other vehicles that's going to help us get there. So, you know, I think we are in a place right now, you know, to, to, to ask your, your direct question, you know, Cooperation Jackson and, the, and the, the government don't have a necessarily a direct relationship with each other. But we don't need to. That's the critical thing that folks need to understand. And, and for us, you know, we, this, for most of our history, for three of the four years that we've existed, we existed with the hostile government. Right? Tony Arbor was not our friend. I know Tony, but he wasn't our friend. He had no, his allegiance was to some forces of capital. There wasn't no allegiance to us or to the people. Right? And Chopa Antar is still favorable. He's still better than most other you know, forces. But the reality is, you know, he's got to deal with the, the limits of the system. And the austerity they're trying to impose. And it's my position, and it's and I think the position of the social movement, I understand the constraints that you are under, but it's my job to push as hard as possible to make sure that you don't succumb to those restraints. Yeah. Right? So we're not always going to agree on what that looks like, but we don't have to. Right? If, you, if you're truly practicing democracy, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Right? You got the right to believe what you believe, I got the right to believe what I want to believe, and there's ways that we can resolve this if we're truly being democratic, which don't resolve to force. Right? Now sometimes that will and have to be used on some other folks when they decide they want to you know, put us back in change or some shit like that. Um, but you know, I think that the ultimate, like I said, um, we are in a place right now of A, trying to maintain the integrity of a vision and a strategy and plan. Trying to learn from our mistakes and trying to move forward with a key understanding that at the end of the day, and this is critical, I think, for everybody to understand what I mean by political maturity. At the end of the day, whatever debate there may be, you know, if people see it as between me and Antar, that's minimal to what Governor Phil Bryan is going to bring for both of our asses. So, you know, like this, we have a tactical disagreement. That's ultimately what that, that, what that amounts to. We have an attack to disagreement. But when they come with, with, with the heat, which we know they're coming, we're going to be on the same side because we really don't have a choice. So it's the point of being mature enough. What I can, what I can and need to argue with you about and what they absolutely cannot be an argument about. Like, I'm not arguing with you about, you know, white supremacy. We're not going to have that argument because we know we agree. I'm not going to argue with you about whether you're anti-capitalist or not. I already know you agree. The question is, you know, where we disagree is on the strategy how to get there. That's a tactical question. That's not a strategic question. And so I, that's why I'm saying I don't think people should get disillusioned by elements of maturity within the social movement, which I see them as being a part of still. Yep. Right? Yep. That's just, you know, hey, we at a point where there's some new questions. I don't have all the answers. I never, you know, and if you think I do, then y'all you, you need to slap me. <laughs> you know? Uh, or if somebody, I'm a bar quote from Walter Rodney, if there's somebody telling you that they know the answers to all the questions, they're either trying to delude themselves or they're trying to delude the people. Right? And that's that's where I think we at. You know, so we got to come up with, with decisions collectively. We got to come up with strategies, you know, collectively. Um, and that's the struggle. You know, the, 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 the struggle for democracy is a constant one. And I don't think anybody in here knows how to do that. That's the critical point I would leave. I don't think any of us in here know how to do that. We've never lived in a democratic society. And that's beautiful to say it. And none of us in here ever lived in a democratic society. So we're learning how to do that. And in the process of learning how to do that, we're going to make mistakes. And that's cool. And that's cool. The, the point is, how do you learn from your mistakes? That's the critical piece. How do you learn from your mistakes to improve? Uh, and, and be focused on learning and, and improving. 
and not be satisfied with, well, I did that five years ago, so I should get a pass today, you know, if I make a mistake. You know, be like, no, you need to be accountable for the mistake here and now. You know, uh, uh, and, and let's build on that point from a point of love and respect. Like, I'm trying to hold you accountable so that you can improve, not to destroy you. Like, I don't have no interest in that. You know, so that, that's the perspective I would offer to kind of give some ground to where I think we need to go and like how within the movement, you know, we need to learn how to deal with differences. Because I'm saying this and belaboring on it because there's, there's something I see that we are trying to battle right now uh, uh, in Jackson, which I see all over the country when I travel. And it, it is somewhat disturbing to me. There's this kind of this notion that people who enter into the struggle have to be perfect. And if, if, if you got to be perfect when you walk into the door, we gonna lose real quick. Cause ain't none of us perfect. You know what I'm saying? So like, if that's your measure by which you judge me, then you ain't gonna work with me. You already excluding yourself from working with me. You know, cause I'm not perfect and I'm gonna make some mistakes. You know, uh, and I expect you to too. And, and we can work on that basis. Awesome, thank you, colleague. So, to close us out, that was amazing. I mean, yep. just been fantastic. Um, I do want to give our respondents just a chance to give us like one, one last clip. No? 30 seconds. Okay. One quick thought. No, not like a, not an or oration, but if there's anything that you want to uplift. And so what I'd like to do is do Elena, Mia, Lisa, and then Input Chuck, and then, um, and then, actually, you know, we could all stand up and clap loudly after that point, and then I won't be able to get on, back on the mic, so let me just say now. Uh, again, we have um, the Porter Square Books, uh, who is here, that's what you're called, right? Yeah. Yes, Porter Square Books, who, um, one of my most popular Facebook posts this year was posting that y'all just became a partially employee-owned business, which is wow. amazing. Nice when uplifting things get reposted. <laughs> I don't, uh, anyway, so, and then se separately, so get your books, get them signed from Kali, and then finally we do have some desserts and coffee. Uh, and so, just from, on behalf of Solidarity Economy Initiative, I want to thank you again for being with us uh, for the last few days in Massachusetts, and again for our panelists. So just have you quickly close up for us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, as bad as things are, as bad as they could be, because of the whole AI stuff that you mentioned, and many, many more things, I keep hope because of Kali and Corporation Jackson, my beautiful comrades sitting here, all of you, my beautiful people and our neighbor, and that is the reason why I hold on to this, and I hope that you do too, because we need all of us, all of us, all of us in this. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I think I'll just give a couple of shout outs really quickly and then just say thank you. Um, so just thinking about, so first I, I just want to shout out Mickey Metz who asked the first question and shout out New Economy Coalition. There's a conference yes. coming up, Common Bound in St. Louis and I'm shouting them out because I went to that conference a couple years ago, learned about platform cooperativism, Mickey Metz was on the panel, blew my mind and uh, that's it. And so thank you, Erin. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Center for Economic Democracy. Thank you, Solidarity Economy Initiative. Thank you, Connor. Uh, this has been wonderful. <laughs> So in the spirit of shout outs, um, I want to shout out that City Life is, um, is, is celebrating 45 years of resist and build, and you are all invited to your birthday party. This is yes. your movement, yes. so you are turning 45 on May 19th. <laughs> so, um, so please, go on our website, clvu.org, and get more information about Uprise, uh, Uprise 45. Uh, I just want to thank Kali for coming uh, and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank uh, Eugema Aaron and the rest of the, the Eugema family for putting this and all the other activities together. And just to say that the truth is within us, we just have to bring it out. I'm in.